standing and our strong is starting. <laughs> Do you have something? Oh, you don't do? Okay. We want to call the heads. Yeah. 
Morning. Morning. Spotlights are on bright today. I'd like to read for you out of 1 Kings 4, uh, the first seven verses for communion meditation. Maybe you're thinking uh, communion meditation ought to be about Christ, and that's the Old Testament, and uh, Jesus is not mentioned there other than prophecy. Well, I'd like to read it to you anyway. Now, a woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, Your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. And then he said, Go borrow containers elsewhere for yourself. Empty containers from all your neighbors. Do not get too few. Then you shall come in and shut the door behind you and your sons, and pour into all these containers, and you shall set aside what is full. So she left him, and she shut the door behind her and her sons. They began bringing the containers to her, and she poured the oil. When the containers were full, she said to her son, Bring me another container. But he said to her, There are no more containers. Then the oil stopped. So she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons can live on the rest. As we look at uh, God's word and we look at this, and yes, it is in First Kings and it is Old Testament, uh, you know, that's a good story, right? What's that, what's that got to do with us? I mean, maybe that's what you're thinking. That's a good story, but it's kind of a one-off there, right? This gal had a need and God took care of it and it, it was a, a good, good thing for her. What's that, what's that got to do with us? Well, I think this story is a pattern of how God provides. I think uh, as you read through the Bible, you realize that God is a great provider. In fact, even before this story, there's many stories of God providing things. Uh, if you look in uh, the New Testament, if you remember the first miracle that Jesus did, he turned the water into wine. They had no wine. They'd ran out at the wedding feast, and his mom said, they're out of wine. And... Uh, he told us, she told the servants, do what he says. So uh, Jesus told the servants to get some jars and fill them to the brim. And they did, and he turned the water into wine so that they had plenty. Uh, and then you have the, the feeding of the 4,000 and the 5,000. He took uh, just a few loaves of bread and a few fish, and he provided a meal for thousands of people. And there was plenty left over. And uh, if you remember the story of uh, Peter and the crew that were fishing, and they had been fishing, and they were cleaning their nets. They had been out all night, and uh, Jesus said, hey, I want to borrow your boat. And he got in the boat, and he went out, and he taught them, uh, the people. And then after he got done teaching, he told Peter, he said, uh, go out a little deeper and cast your nets. And Peter said, man, we've, we've worked all night, but Master, since you say so. And they went out, and they cast their nets out, and, you know, they had a great catch. And uh, the nets were full, and uh, they about sank the boats. And again, also, uh, after the resurrection, uh, they were fishing, and Jesus told them, cast your nets on the other side. God is a great provider. God provided over and over again for his people, and he still does that today. And as we come to this time of communion, I think what we need to learn from these stories is like the lady at the oil, we need to keep pouring. We need to keep pouring ourselves into people. Uh, Wednesday nights here, we're pouring ourselves into the children. Uh, we've got a lot of children coming, a lot of youth, and uh, we got a lot of people here in the church that are pouring their lives into them, teaching them the Word of God, and hopefully putting a strong foundation in them. Uh, you know, when it comes to uh, the water into wine, I think that lesson tells us that we need to keep filling we need to keep filling people with God's word. We need to keep uh, filling them with the things that they need to know on what it takes to live forever with the King of Kings. And I think when it comes to the feeding, I think uh, we need to be feeding constantly on God's word. We need to learn what God says, and then that way, by learning that, we can feed people the word of God and show them 
how that they can live their lives so they can live eternally. And then fishing. We need to keep fishing. You know, sometimes uh, when we're working in the church, and I've heard it said, man, I'm just burnt out. Just things don't seem to be going the way. And I've seen lots of people over the years, they get burnt out and they want to leave. And I'm thankful that Jesus... didn't get burnt out for me. So I think what that lesson teaches us is we need to cast the nets because the master said so. And uh, if the fishing gets a little tough, maybe we throw the nets on the other side. Try something different, but always keep the word the same. In Romans chapter 5, it says this, God also provided for all of us. God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Let's think about these things. Pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for this day. We thank you for the blessings you give us each and every day. I'm thankful, dear God, that you sent your son Jesus to die for me on the cross and die for all of us, Lord. I'm also thankful that he raised again, that we too may live with you forever. I pray, Lord, it should help us to be a faithful church. Forgive us where we fail you, Lord. I ask you to watch over and guide us, help us to be the salt and light that we need to be in this world we live in. That's all this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body. In the same manner, he took the cup. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant, the blood of the new covenant. Poured out for the forgiveness of sins for many. Good morning. It is good to be up here today, 
And I want to say something. Uh, Scott talked about all of you who are pouring your lives into our kids on Wednesday nights and on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights. But I also want to acknowledge those in our church, um, the men and women who are leaving, leading adult Bible studies and the guys who come up here and pour into your lives through the meditations. Because one of the things I want to encourage and, and I get encouraged by is when these guys are up here and they're talking, a lot of times they've not gone through schooling for this. This is something that God has put on their hearts. And as you saw with Scott today, not only did God put it on his heart, but God was still working on his heart and what he was saying. And they're willing to share that and be open with all of us. We need to appreciate that and thank, not just thank them, but thank God for putting that on their hearts. Um, and I want to say thank you for all of you who do that. I really appreciate you guys putting your hearts out there and the worship team when they're up here, when they do that. It is, it's just encouraging. So thank you all for doing that and pouring into our lives and pouring into my life. Um, this summer, we've been going through the first three chapters of Acts, and we've been looking at how the first Church of Christ started in these first three chapters, and how we as Christ, Christ Church today are supposed to go sharing the gospel message, doing his good works, going with the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what we are called to do. And if we do this with the power of the Holy Spirit in us, great things will happen, right? Right? We saw last week how Peter and John are going to pray, and they met a lame man on the way. And he asked for silver and gold, and they say, silver and gold we don't have, but we're going to help the issue you really need. And he reaches down, and he tells the man, get up and walk in the name of Jesus Christ. And great things happened. And the man jumped and rejoiced and jumped around and then people started coming around and it gave them the opportunity to share the gospel message. And this is happening over and over again. And there are so much great things that come with being Christ's witness. Have you ever had a moment where you got to see someone come to Christ after you've witnessed to them? Isn't that so rewarding? Especially if you're a parent and your kid has come to Christ and they've been baptized and they're living in the church. And some of you may be even at the age where you see them get up here and do communion meditations and be involved in the church. Isn't that a great feeling? Isn't that a positive thing? Here's the catch. With anything positive in our lives, there's almost always a side effect. Have you ever seen that when you go to take medicine? The medicine is going to help you, but almost always there's a side effect. Um, there was one medicine that I saw online that there was all this good stuff it did for you. And it's actually a supplement that it was supposed to help you um, have less uh, inflammation in your knees and joints. It was supposed to make you be just a little more in delightful and have a little more just oomph in your step and kind of get the, the stuff in your brain flowing. Obviously, it's not working on me today. But it gets stuff pumping and just supposed to be good for you, but there was one big side effect. It made you very gassy. All right? And that, that side effect, it, you, get, you get, sit there and go, yeah, that's not too bad. But when you're sitting in a room and I had this experience and you can't hold it in and it just comes out. It's embarrassing when you're sitting there in front of five older ladies in the church. It just isn't. It's not good. Side effects are going to happen. And sometimes some side effects are more severe. But we go with the side effects because the good things that come from taking that are way outweigh any of the side effects that may happen. Now, sometimes there are goofy side effects like this may cause death. Probably not a good medication to take. But when we're followers of Christ, there are side effects. Jesus actually warns his followers of this in Mark 13. He shows and he's talking to them of how intense the persecution is going to get 
before he comes back. And he tells them in verse 13, everyone will hate you because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Jesus said the world is going to hate you. And actually in other type places, he talks about the world will persecute you. And that word persecution doesn't just mean that they're going to attack you physically. Persecute means to pursue, to try to shut down or to contain or to get rid of. What they're doing is opposition is going to rise up and they are going to do everything to silence the church. They're going to do everything to try to get Christianity wiped off of the earth, whether that's by wiping out Christians or just doing things to get them to be quiet and no longer follow Christ. Opposition is going to happen. Even Jesus warns his followers in Matthew 10, 16. He says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Whew. That's why I like this picture here. You see the sheep standing there, getting ready to go out among wolves, standing in front of opposition. And when you look at that picture, doesn't that scare you? If I told you you are the sheep, isn't that a scary sight? Even if I told you you're not the sheep, you're a, you're a human being walking among wolves into a pack of them. That is terrifying. I will tell you, I know this because when I was growing up, uh, there was a camp I went to, and outside of one of the cabins, there actually every night would be a pack of wolves that would come up. And when I was a junior counselor, us junior counselors were allowed to go out after all the kids went to bed, and we were allowed to go into this cabin and just hang out and talk and just kind of take it easy. I will tell you, I got the cabin next to the wolves. I never left at night. Even if I had to go to the bathroom, I held it because I was not about to go out among the wolves. But Jesus says we're going to have to. I'm sending you out there. There's going to be opposition. They're going to hate you, but you need to stand firm until the end and you will be saved. And Acts 4 we see after Peter and John have done this miraculous thing, this guy is jumping around, people are listening to the gospel message, they face opposition. And they face a great, intimidating opposition. And today we're going to look at their powerful response to opposition. And the three results that should be encouraging to us. In Acts chapter 3, like I said, remember, Peter and John have healed this man. And as all this is going on, the opposition begins to arise and they try to shut down the church right off the bat. In Acts 4, 1 through 4, we find this. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. So Peter and John have done nothing wrong. They're out there actually helping somebody. They did a good deed. And out of nowhere, they get arrested. You know what? They didn't get a verbal warning. They didn't get someone come up and tap them on the shoulder. Hey, could you come over here? Okay, so that's a no-no. We don't do that in the temple. Only we teach and preach. Maybe you should just go sit down, go back home. They didn't get a verbal warning. They didn't even get a, hey, we're going to have a meeting with you. Come back on Monday. Let's talk. It says that they were seized. And actually, the Greek here is better translated as they laid their hands on them violently and threw them in jail. 
This isn't just a, hey, come with us. They grabbed them aggressively and angrily. And it wasn't just some temple guards that do this. It is the priests, the Sadducees, and the captain of the temple guard. This is the top guys who enforce the laws. These are the big deal. You see, sometimes if you were out and you see a police car pull up to a house, you go, oh, I wonder what's going on there. Maybe someone's in trouble. Maybe something bad is happening. Maybe they're just friends with the police officer. I don't know. But you don't know what's going on. It could be bad. And if you are the house that they pull up to, you're going, well, what did I do? And you start running through your head. Do I have any unpaid parking tickets? Do, did, did I mess up um, over here and uh, run a red light or something? What, what did I do? But what happens if all of a sudden you hear helicopters outside of your house and you look out and there's guys in an FBI jacket, a U.S. Marshal, and the Secret Service all show up to your front porch and your roof and your back porch. They've got you surrounded. What's going through your mind then? Oh, no, I really messed up. Up. And not just there, if you are sitting back and you are watching, and let's say you're driving down the road, if you see a police car, you're just gonna, you may even stop to see what's happening. But U.S. Marshals, all this happens, you're looking and going, I better get out of here before I get implicated. Let's go. Uh, this is bad news. These guys are in trouble. And you see, these three religious groups, the reason why they act this way is because it says they are greatly disturbed. Because, first, they're teaching in the temple, and that is our job. How dare these guys who have no training or know nothing stand up and teach and people listen to them instead of us? And they get, they're get they disturbed by that, but they're also upset because they're preaching about Jesus and his resurrection and the resurrection of the dead. Woo-wee, it's only been a couple months. We just got rid of Jesus. We killed him. And then, yeah, the rumors out there that he resurrected from the dead and people saw him and all this, but we covered it up. We can't let this start happening again. We've got to nip this in the bud. we got to get rid of this. Last time there were people that started to rise up with Jesus. We can't have this happen again. And so they go through this process of intimidation by grabbing them angrily and throwing them in prison and leaving them there overnight. But the intimidation doesn't work. And this is where we find encouragement. Because in verse 4, Luke just seems to slip this in. It doesn't seem to fit, but when you look at it, it really does. Even though it says, but... That means even though they were thrown in prison, many who heard the message believed. The intimidation didn't work. The opposition couldn't stop the church from growing. And it says they grew to about 5,000. If you remember, they've already grown to over 3,000. So this is a couple thousand more, and they've been growing daily. So this could be 1,000, this could be 1,500. We don't really know what the number exactly is, but it was a lot. And it's after they get arrested and they get thrown in prison because the message of the gospel cannot be stopped. Too often, I've heard, and and not just now, but since I was a little kid, I've heard people talk in the church, and the things I hear is the government keeps trying to take God out of our country. It's going to kill the church. All these laws and bills that get passed, they took prayer out of our schools. The church is going to die because of it. Our world is so corrupt, 
The church can't thrive and can't grow in a world this corrupt. There is so much evil in the world, the church is going to die. And I've heard that a lot, and I continue to hear that. We get so discouraged. But John, in 1 John 4, as he's warning Christians of false teachers and people who will go against Christ and be considered anti-Christ, in verse 4, he gives them this encouragement. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And to me, that is the greatest and most encouraging thing when opposition arises is we have God on our side. So whom shall we fear? I love that song from earlier this morning. Whom shall I fear? The God of angel armies. We have God on our side. Opposition can't stop God. The things of this world isn't going to stop the church from growing. Now, the people inside the church can. You can see a church self-destruct, and we'll talk about that next week and what you do with that. But right now, when it comes to opposition from outside in on the church, we've got God. Actually, when you look at what's happening with Peter and his response to the top religious leaders, they've got him surrounded. And it talks about here in verses 5 through 7, it talks about how they've got all of the religious leaders, the teachers of the law, all of the high priest family, all of them, all sitting there. They've even got the elders and the rulers there. So they've got them surrounded by a whole bunch of people, kind of like what's happening right now, where everyone's staring at you, and they're judging you by what you're saying. And then, but on top of it, they sit there, and as they're staring at Peter and John, they begin to grill them. And they begin to just start asking questions and really digging at them. I will tell you, that intimidation factor alone is tough. When I was in college at Johnson Bible College, what you had to do in your last hermeneutics, which is a Bible or like a preaching class, the last hermeneutics thing you had to do was you had to stand up, one in front of your peers, but also in front of 15 to 20 professors who have spent their whole life in God's Word who know everything, who are great preachers, and they are all sitting there staring at you with a pen and a paper writing everything you do down. The intimidation factor is big. And as they do that, one thing that was written on my paper a lot was, don't move your hands so much. And obviously that didn't work when they wrote that down. But here, they've got them surrounded, and they've got them right there looking at them. And the question they ask is, by what power or what name did you do this? Peter should be terrified. But in Acts 4, 8 through 12, it says this, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. You see that? Filled with the Holy Spirit. That is who's on our side, is we have the Holy Spirit, not just with us, but in us. And he said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. The Holy Spirit comes and gives them courage. 
Notice here in front of the most religious and biblically sound people in the world, Peter doesn't shy away from the truth. He, with the strength of his Holy Spirit, tells them the truth just like Jesus promised he would in Luke 12, 11 through 12. As Jesus is talking to them and warning them that they are going to be brought in front of synagogues, he tells them this, when you are brought before synagogues, rulers and authorities, do not worry about how you would defend yourselves or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Peter isn't speaking on his own behalf or on what he thinks he should do or what he thinks should be done. He is just speaking the truth courageously. Too often as Christians, when we get intimidated or we see our freedoms slipping away, especially here in America, we as the church and as individual Christians begin to feel like we're under attack and we react in fear. And when we do that, oftentimes we begin to go back and do what the rest of the world is doing. And we go into name calling and we go into shaming and we go into picking on people and tearing others down because they disagree with what we think should happen. We lose our focus on what our mission as the church is and what message we are called to preach. I talked once, had gone into a, a friend of mine's small town, and as I went in there, we were talking, and I sat in on the sermon, and never once in the sermon did I hear Jesus mentioned. I did hear about our political rights, who you should vote for, um, how everything is being taken away from us and how we should be rising up. And even the minister stood up there and boldly said, we should be taking our guns and preparing to, ri to rage against the government if they keep taking our stuff away. When I heard that, I leaned over and I said, is this just a, a one-time thing? And what I was told is, no, this is what Christianity is here. It is just, we feel attacked, so we need to fight back. And I will tell you, when you do that, Satan wins. Because if you are focused on what's happening in the government, you're focused on trying to fight all of these freedoms and rights that I have or I deserve, what are you not talking about? Jesus. You are going away from talking about who Jesus is and doing the job that we're called to do. To preach the gospel message. In Titus 2, 6-8, Paul teaches, similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good in your teaching. Show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. This is exactly what Peter does here. After he speaks the religious leaders in verses 3 and 16, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. It was undeniable who was speaking through them. And not only who was speaking through them, in verse 16 they said, and this is the leaders and the, fair, the teachers of the law. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. It's undeniable. God is working in them. The way they live, the way they speak, they speak the truth, and it may sting 
but we can't deny that it comes from God. Are we speaking in that way? Are we as the church, do people look at us and hear what we say and see what we do and say, it is undeniable that that church has the Holy Spirit in them. It's undeniable that they're following Christ. Once we get to there, we have this boldness and we may stand up and speak the truth. But that doesn't mean that those who are opposed to God when they hear this and can't deny it, they're still going to fight. Because there are some that just don't care that God may be right, the Bible may be true, but they don't like it and they want to shut it down no matter what. And when that happens, we see that in Acts 4, 18 through 20. Then they called them again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Peter and John, even as they are getting threatened, and in verse 21 it says they continue to threaten them after this. They're getting threat after threat. They still obey God. Does this not sound like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they are told bow down and worship the idol. And they say, no. No, do it now or we throw you in the furnace. And they say, no, our God will save us. And even if he doesn't, we worship only our God. We're going to, we may disobey here and still follow God, and we will take the consequence if we have to. We know the consequence will come, but we will obey God no matter what the consequence. The same thing with Daniel and the lion's den. They are, he goes in, and these guys are trying to get rid of Daniel, and so they say, you know what? Let's convince the king to put out that nobody should pray to anybody but the king. And Daniel keeps praying. And he doesn't hide it either. He leaves the window open so that anyone who wants to see can still see him praying. And he gets thrown in the lion's den. One thing you'll notice, though, is each of these things, they disobey their worship, their praying, and their teaching the gospel message. Those are the three things they disobey on because that's what God has called us to do. They're not going to disobey God. They're going to follow and obey God. If our government comes and tells us we need to quit worshiping God, if you keep worshiping or preaching or teaching, we're going to shut you down or throw you in prison. Are we going to keep doing that? I will tell you, I know our elders, I know me, I know our deacons, and I know many of this church. There are many that will keep coming and keep preaching, but are you part of that? What happens when that goes down? If we're told you need to, you need to quit praying in public, you can't pray for your meal. If someone's in need, you can't go and pray for them you got to do it in, in your home, privately, away from everybody. Are we going to quit praying for people? I want to encourage you. If you're hearing this and going, this is scary. I know the Holy Spirit's supposed to give me courage, but I am terrified of this. This, this seems like a lot. That's okay. It is scary. Being that sheep looking at the wolves is intimidating. It's a scary thing to be in. And even after having the courage to stand up in front of the Sanhedrin, 
Peter and John went back to the church. They tell them everything that they've been told, everything that happened. And the church's response isn't to throw a party. It isn't to order a whole bunch of pizzas. The church's response is they go to God in prayer. And they talk to God and they talk about what God has been doing through Jesus. And then they get to the end of the prayer and they prayed this in Acts 4, 29 through 30. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they quit praying, it says the Holy Spirit filled them and gave them strength. And they began to preach the gospel message boldly. We need to be asking for boldness. And when you get scared, it's okay. Go to God in prayer and ask him to give you the strength and the courage to do it. We have an opportunity to do this this Tuesday. Uh, the Women's Resource Center is starting a new mobile medical unit here in Fountain County. Um, and as they are getting ready to do this, at 9.30 a.m., they're asking people to come and to pray over this medical center as they begin this new ministry. And it it's, seems like a God thing because in the midst of this, there's also something else that's happened in the past week. And I know several of you have rejoiced in this and are excited about this, and some may not be, but Roe versus Wade got overturned. But here's the part of this that gets scary. You ready? There are groups out there who have stepped up and they have said, anybody who is against abortion or who is pro-life, those organizations... They're marked and they may get attacked. And there are several that have already been attacked. And you know what? Our Women's Resource Center has said, we're not just stepping back. We're stepping up and going further into it and doing more. We need to pray for them and pray for boldness for them and courage and strength as opposition arises because we're going to see more and more opposition arise in this. And we need to continue to preach the gospel and show the love of Christ doing good works no matter what comes. As the praise team comes forward, we're going to pray. And afterwards, the praise team will sing a song. And I want to encourage you, if you want to join God's family today, you can. As we read earlier as Peter stated, salvation is found in no one else, only in Christ. If you want to start by repenting and coming, confessing and believing and taking a step of faith and obedience in baptism, receiving the Holy Spirit and beginning your walk in faith today, please come forward. If you want to talk more about it, please, I encourage you to do that. But I also want to encourage you as we pray right now. I want to invite the rest of you as God's church to pray with me for the church to remain bold and stand strong in the truth. No matter what opposition arises in the coming days and coming weeks and years. That we continue to live for God courageously. Stand with me as we pray. Dear God, we come right now thanking you for being our God, thanking you for your love, for sending Jesus, Lord, and allowing us to be a part of your family, and then giving us the job to go out and preach your word so that others may be a part of the family too, that they may receive this forgiveness, Lord. But as we do that, we know opposition will arise, and Lord, right now, it may not be big here in Covington, but across our country, 
opposition is great in some areas for the church and for those who claim and do follow you, Lord. We pray that they don't cower back, but they stand strong in the truth, continuing to do your will, obeying you no matter the consequence. And Lord, I pray if that comes to us, that you help us to do the same. So that we as a church across the world can stand strong in opposition because we know no matter what, Lord, you are with us and you will win in the end. We thank you so much and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.